like to start, Brian? Yeah, I can just uh, I can just take it from here if you'd like. That'd be um, awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks to everybody for joining. Is uh, is my audio sound okay? Good to me. Great. Okay. Um, uh, I think everybody got a little handout, so I can I can kind of ex just give a quick description of who we are and and where we've been and uh, and where we're headed, maybe quickly. Um, but we started it about uh, 15 years ago or 14 years ago here on site um, in Warren at our farm. Um, I had uh, gotten a wine job right out of college when I was 21 um, in Vermont of all places. Um, went to U UVM, I was a wildlife and fisheries biology major and forestry. Um, knew I wanted to be outside, um, but didn't really think agriculture was kind of a, an option at the time. Um, but I got a job at a small vineyard and winery in Vermont near there, um, and I haven't done anything else since. Um, I worked there for about four years and then um, went on and got a graduate degree from Fresno State University in Fresno, California, and then, um, and then here to Maine. I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland, um, but my wife Allie is from uh, Yarmouth, and so she wanted to come back to Maine, and, um, and here we are. So. Um, so we found a nice piece of land here in Warren. Um, we kind of wanted to be somewhat near the coast for sort of a little bit more moderated climate maybe. And at least at the time we thought for tourist uh, traffic because um, that's the, who we thought we would sell wine to here in Maine. Um, but we also wanted good agricultural soils and, and, the, and that kind of thing. So we found a kind of a, a good scrappy farm here. Our farm is like a lot of stuff on the coast. It's um, rocky and and, hilly a little bit um, and I think our initial vision was to um, grow lots of grapes and, and make a bunch of wine. We thought we'd maybe end up in the 2500 case range or something like that, um, kind of coming all from the from the farm. Um, we pretty quickly realized that that was a little bit maybe too ambitious uh, to start and um, grapes, we knew this, but uh, grapes take time and um, and we couldn't ignore the fact that uh, that getting some cash flow was really really important um, because we needed to be here all the time too. We couldn't just work remotely and try to also tend the tend the farm. So um, so we so we started making wine with grapes that we purchased from other vineyards. And um, here in Maine, the closest we can really go for kind of excess to the local industry is New York State, either um, Finger Lakes in New York or Long Island. And uh, so we've kind of formed strong relationships with a couple of growers um, in those places. And, um, and then as kind of as time has gone along, um, now we're kind of on top of the sales piece and the, and, um, the kind of portfolio of wines, I guess. And um, now in just the last couple of years, so after 10 years or so, we're, we feel like we're finally on top of it and really trying to get back to the agriculture piece too. So, um, so we've been cultivating two and a half acres of grapes for about uh, 10 years. And then the last couple of years, we've planted a couple more. We're gonna plant two more acres this coming spring. Um, and we'd like to do that another acre or so until we get to 10 acres or 12 acres, something like that. And, um, and maybe kind of call that good. Um, but, uh, but in the meantime, these wines that we've made from our uh, purchased fruit have really gained in popularity and done well. And we can't ignore that. Um, um, kind of keeping up on that thing too. So we've grown to about 4,000 cases now. And, um, and yeah, so that's about where we are. But, um, but anyway, uh, what we wanted to do, what I wanted to do here a little bit is, um, is describe a little bit more winemaking process, you know, especially because we're, and we can talk a little bit about the vineyards and, and their cultural practices of these places um, and terroir and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but um, but because these are these are all purchased um, these are these this is all fruit that we purchased from from other vineyards. Um, it's a little bit more about uh, kind of for us style and and decisions we make as winemakers um, on uh, on everything through the process. So that's kind of what we wanted to to talk about here. Um, yeah. Now, did you ever did, did you have something to chime in? Um. Not really. That's great. Um, I only, I was sort of like, I just, 
it, it's interesting to hear that you're doing 4,000 cases a year. Um, that feels like a lot out of the, the space that you have there. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I know, I know, you know, I know it feels like a lot to you. Yeah. Um, yes. We, we, we now, we, everything is made in about a 2000 square foot, uh, basement of a barn. Um, but kind of the general, general winemaking industry standard is about, a, uh, at least a square foot per case of wine produced. And so when we got to, yeah, the 1800 cases, we knew we needed some more space. And so we, um, we actually are le right now leasing about 2000 square feet down the road to store all of our wine in. So everything is produced in the, on the farm, bottled on the farm. And then we pretty, pretty much immediately chuck it up the road to this little warehouse that we have um, to store. And um, we're building another building on site to hopefully take the place of that warehouse. Um, so then everything will be back here again, but, um, but we're still, we're still um, selling out of wine too, too fast. So we're kind of trying to make this, those decisions on whether we grow some more, um, which means find some other space or, or stay put and, um, and be happy with what we got. So um, of that, that 4,000 cases, like how much of that is cider? Yeah, I think cider right now, cider for us has kind of gone up and down a little bit um, over the last eight years or so. Uh, cider, I think right now might be a total of um, six or 700 cases. Okay. So, I guess it, I guess it also sort of depends on how big the apple harvests are. Cause like, right. You can't, you yeah. can't make cider if you don't have apples. So that's right. That's right. And we make a couple of ciders that one, one really relies on the, the quantity of apples around here and the ones we can gather. And then the other one that we, um, that we work with local orchards. And so we can sort of get how much, however much we want. But, um, but yeah, but cider for a while, uh, maybe six or seven years ago, felt like it was going to be a bigger, bigger thing for us. And we were kind of gaining and then it, then it kind of tailed off a little bit. And, and now we're kind of happier and more pleased with the way the wines are moving than cider now. So um, yeah. So it's like maybe 10, 15% of what we're doing right now. Okay. All right, cool. So let's, cool. all right, let's, let's go into winemaking. All right, let's go. So, um, so I think everybody should have uh, seven samples mm -hmm. um, and uh, wines number one and number two um, are Chardonnay. And so um, this fruit is sourced from Long Island. Um, we have this little, we've been buying grapes from Long Island, um, New York, for um, since we started it really. And about uh, six years ago or so, um, we formed a relationship with, uh, with a gentleman who's a vineyard manager and he, um, he leases this uh, 10 acre vineyard piece, um, which we call Tucker, Tucker Lane Vineyard. Um, he doesn't own it, he just leases it and grows, grows the fruit. And we had been buying from, um, we started buying from this small vineyard, um, um, about yeah, six years ago. And uh, now we've kind of really been working together. Um, and it's now kind of, we've sort of taken over and it's kind of our vineyard. So we buy every grape now from this 10 acre piece, which, um, which lets us uh, um, kind of dictate a little bit more of, of growing um, styles, growing uh, practices. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, we had, we, we really kind of moved in on it because we, we're making this uh, wine Morphos Rosé, which is a pet nat style rosé made with Merlot. And, um, and it felt like a consistent source of Merlot. So it had five acres of Merlot there. Um, it also had five acres of Chardonnay on this vineyard, which we hadn't made Chardonnay um, yet. And so we've started to. And so Chardonnay is sort of now becoming our, um, is gonna sort of becoming our house, house white wine. Um, so anyway, um, being uh, natural sort of styled winemakers that we are, um, we we pick and ferment without adding anything. We don't uh, no acid adjustments, no sugar adjustments, uh, you know, no sulfur at crush, uh, no enzymes, no tannins, um, any of that stuff. So um, we have sort of fewer, I guess, decisions to make um, at at crush or at, at the, the fermentation time. Uh, than a lot of winemakers do, but um, but we have some choices, and kind of we wanted to highlight these choices that we make um, here. So uh, anyway, um, 
our Chardonnay, um, what we wanted in a Chardonnay and a house style Chardonnay was sort of uh, was crisp, crisp and refreshing, um, lighter styled, um, higher acid. Um, I think it is uh, Long Island tends to be a little bit more traditional and in, in that they want to, they want, they want to get things as ripe as they possibly possibly can. That's kind of their uh, seems like the goal. Um, and so we're a little bit odd in that we want to be the, we want to be the first person's picking Chardonnay down there. We want to, we want it, um, we want it early. So, um, so we actually picked this Chardonnay um, kind of right after the sparkling wine producers pick. Um, so typically it's sparkling wine producers and then, um, and then a couple of weeks after, and then then we then we start picking for 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 still wine. But we kind of picked this almost right after sparkling wine um, folks finish picking. So um, so this Chardonnay is picked at uh, well, let's see, 20, 20.6 bricks. Uh, although things happened fast this year, so um, so things got ripe really fast, really early, and it, it was ripening fast. So we we picked at twenty point six bricks in a pH of three point two three. And a titratable acidity of seven point three two. Those those are our numbers, um, but we wanted to do a couple couple different things with Chardonnay. We wanted to make one that was uh, uh, fresh and crisp, and um, kind of fresh and crisp and clean. And then we wanted to do play a little bit with skin contact. And so so wines number one and number two, uh, wine number one. Um, so picked same day, uh, same time, same vineyard. Um, Wine number one is picked and pressed and um, wild fermented. Nothing added, nothing taken away, all that business. Um, and number you, two. If I can just ask, so you, picks, you picked it and like drove it back to Maine and then, and then pressed it when it got back to Maine? Um, so we do, a, we, do a, we do a few different things. Or did you press it there at the... Yeah, so we do we do okay. a few different we have a we have a small box truck that we can haul three tons of fruit in. And um if I can haul three tons, uh if our lot size is three tons or smaller, then I'll haul it home and deal with it there. But um and so this but this whole uh, this Chardonnay block uh, produced about 10 tons for us, and um much of it went into this wine number one. And so I went down and, and brought home three tons of of uh, fruit for the wine number two, but the wine number one we had pressed down there, and then um, and then brought to us. Okay. Um, there's a big winery down there that does kind of custom crush type stuff, and so we can tell them, uh, you know, crush it, chill it for us, and and then um, and then we'll come get it. So, uh, so wine number one is picked and pressed, yeah, down there, but both picked on the same day. Um, and number two, number two is two days of skin contact. So, um, so wine number two is uh, crossed and stemmed, and then we leave it in open top bins for two days. Um, and then after two days, then we scoop it out and um, and press it. And so I think we should just taste the first smell and taste the first two. And so that is the the distinction of these two. So otherwise, same vineyard, pick same day. Um, otherwise, same practices, uh, wild yeast fermented, um, no additions. And these are both, uh, these are both, I'm sorry, and these are both fermented in, in neutral oak barrels. Um, so older, older oak barrels. Um, yeah. So I'm um I'm a, I've been a little bit slow to um to warm up to um, orangey style wines. Um, you know I have, I have kind of a traditional uh, education and, and background, um, but I've always done things in the sort of naturally f fashion. But I've been a little bit slow to warm up to orange wines, and so we're kind of cautiously playing with um, skin contact on white wines. And so our uh, 
we don't know exactly what we'll do with these two with these two portions, whether they'll go together uh, to make a something that's a little bit between uh, for a house white wine or whether we'll um, or at least one is, you know, is Chardonnay and one is uh, skin contact Chardonnay. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, how do you so once how do you transport it back up to Maine? Like once it's like juice or it, so it, go, it goes through like initial fermentation down there in New York. And do you then like transport it back in, in tank? Yeah, no, it doesn't do any fermentation down there. Um, okay. So it gets, it gets picked, you know, we're there, it gets picked and it gets pressed um, and then chilled. Okay. And, then, and then we um, either go down and get the juice ourselves because um, now it weighs less because there's no skins or seeds or stems. Um, so either we go get it ourselves or, uh, or we have somebody truck it up to us um, while, still, while still cold. And so it doesn't ferment until it gets here um, to the farm. Okay, cool. Yeah. That, makes, that makes sense. Yeah. And depending on the, depending on how big the lot is, you know, depending on how, how we, depends on how we receive it. Um, yep. again, if, if it's, if it's under three tons and I can go get it with my box truck, uh, if it's a little bit more, we might pay somebody to do it. If it's a, if it's a really big lot, um, we have, uh, hired uh, tanker, tanker trucks to, Call it. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. They're very different. They're pretty like, they have like pretty completely different characters. The number yeah. one is so much like, is like tropical and bright and fresher and has more, like more apparent acidity. And number two is like less fruit, but more like aromatic spices and stuff like that. Mm hmm. Um, and more savory flavors. Um, so at this point, um, both of these wines have gone through malolactic fermentation. Um, not always our, in, our intention, um, but uh, having a white wine like this go through malolactic, malolactic fermentation, um, but still retain good acidity and, and good freshness makes me happy um, because as, as, natural winemakers, we don't want to filter things. Uh, we want things to be as biologically stable as possible. And, um, and adding as little sulfur as possible and going, on, going into a bottle unfiltered uh, means we really want good biological stability. Um, if we don't have good biological stability, then something can start fermenting again in the bottle um, and that can get messy. So, um, yeah. What do you what do you mean by good biological stability? You mean like it's finished malolactic and it's and like it still has a more acidity, like it's lower on the pH scale because that will just help prevent Mal malolactic fermentation. Really wants to happen in, in yeah. fruit, and so in order to in order to stop it to to retain the acidity that you want, maybe in a really fresh white wine, you have to add sulfur, mm -hmm. uh, and and we try to push off adding sulfur as long as possible to right before bottling. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, and then you have to, you have to make sure you have more sulfur in that wine as well, so that it doesn't then go through malolactic fermentation in the bottle. Um, and that's assuming that you haven't filtered, filtered the bacteria out, um, through filtration or something like that. And so we want to go in as with, with as little sulfur as possible and no filtration. And so, uh, it's nice to see that something has gone through malolactic fermentation, um, that means this kind of has nowhere else to go is I okay. guess the idea. Um, okay. Nothing else that really wants to happen to that wine biologically um, once it's in the bottle. So it's good and safe. Okay. All right. But, um, but the fact that it, that it retains good freshness and good acidity makes me happy because we wanted a, because we want a fresh crisp wine. Yeah. Um, we didn't want the, the, the buttery flabby malactic thing. Cool. Yeah. Cool. That makes okay. sense. That does. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so this vineyard, I can tell you a little more of that vineyard too. The, um, so the 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 vineyard uh, manager that we work with um, has been um, this vineyard. I think is about. I think it was planted in like the nineteen seventies. Um, so for Long Island, um, it's on the older side. Some newer vines planted in here and there within it, but um, um, 
and this is a clone of Chardonnay that I think is called, the, they call the Colmar clone. Um, and I think down there, they might even call it like the tropical clone or something. It does have, uh, especially when it reaches right around 20 bricks, it, it, it gets uh, more tropical characters, tropical notes, um, which is pretty neat. Um, but this vineyard is, um, the vineyard manager, Howard, is uh, he's been around for, for a long time and always been um, kind of a, organically minded. Um, down there, it's very, very difficult uh, with fungal pressure um, to be truly organic. Um, there may, I think there's one certified organic vineyard on Long Island and that's it. Um, there was, there's a couple other practicing organic, but maybe not certified. Um, you know, they wanna retain some, some tools in their toolbox just in case. Um, but this vineyard, um, we're sort of trying to slowly get it fully organic um, if we can. So when, we, so when we moved in, it was, you know, he, he spread compost uh, instead of synthetic fertilizer, but, um, but did these other things that were sort of non-organic. And so we're, so we're slowly trying to move towards uh, more fully organic. Maybe in the next couple of years, we will have it there. Uh, a slow transition is really good because um, the plants are kind of used to these treatments. Um, so here we, um, so right now we kind of call it on the sustainable side. So it's um, uh, compost is added, no, no synthetic fertilizers, um, no herbicides underneath the vines. So we, we cultivate mechanically underneath the vines here. Um, uh, but then a mix of sort of synthetic and um, organic fungicides are used for, for, fungus, prote for fungus protection. So, so that's the, uh, those are the practices. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm curious how much fruit, so there's five acres of this, how much fruit does that actually produce? Yeah. So this is, this is an older style vineyard. So it's, um, uh, so the older ones produce a little bit less, number one. Um, also the older style vineyards in Long Island were planted with, um, like 10 foot row spacing. So pretty wide to get wider tractors through. Cause that's kind of how they started is they had transform their potato tractor into a vineyard tractor or whatever. Yep. Um, and so when you have fewer vines per acre like that, you just tend to produce less um, total fruit. Yep. Okay. So we, we hope we hope here two to two to two and a half tons to the acre maybe on Chardonnay. Okay. Um, two and a half tons. All right. Yeah. Per acre. Modern uh, modern vineyards down there that are planted eight foot spacing. Um, and you know, with younger, they, they would hope for three to four, or something like that, tons to the acre. Okay. Um, why, I'm also curious, why do you use uh, old oak barrels for this? And you know, wh why and how do you think that, like what, what is, what, how does that change the wine as compared to if you're using stainless steel or something like that? Yeah, um, I kind of, uh, I like the way that the wine that wines age in barrels a little bit better than, than keeping them in a in a stainless steel tank. Um, I have a harder time keeping things um, kind of fresh and without uh, uh, negative growth on the surface, especially on the surface of the wines in a stainless steel tank. Um, uh, the um, the oak barrels really f uh, you can fill them well and. Um, um, this sort of vacuum happens in, in an oak barrel because of the passive breathing through the wood. Um, okay. Yeah, so, so when you hammer that bung down hard on the barrel, um, you want to form this sort of vacuum, um, which really keeps uh, spoilage down. And um, yeah. Okay. And there's, there's definitely something that happens even in an old oak barrel with that with that sort of slow oxidate, oxidation through the, through the staves, not oxidation, but oxidative character and, and oxygen uh, flow through the barrel staves um, that doesn't happen in a, in a stainless steel tank. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you, like, can you, how, how would this, how would those wines have been different if they had been in stainless steel? Do you have, do you have some, like, can you like sort of imagine in your head, like what the, you know what the difference would be? Yeah. Um, so, so I, I wine number one Chardonnay. Um, I pulled a sample from an oak barrel because I felt like it was a more even comparison between one and two because two is in is all in oak barrels. Yeah. Um, you have some. I think half of wine number one is in a stainless steel tank right now. Okay. 
Yep. So I invite you to all to come up and taste that one too. But, uh, cool. but, um, but yeah, that one you would see, um, I think is, is, uh, is still retaining more CO2 from primary fermentation. Um, so it tastes even like it tastes zippier um, than, than, than the wine number one in barrel. So, okay. yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, like what you would expect. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. Harder edges, harder edges, a little more CO2 still in there. Yeah. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, cool. All right. Well, maybe we'll move on to, to the second set, maybe, if that's... Uh, sure. Does that, yeah. Up? That sounds good. Franck one and two yeah um so uh ryan Ned, can i just say i have to admit when i first opened these wines this is michael hi um the nose was overwhelming to me the the, the tones of cider and and vinegar i love them now but an hour ago when i opened them i was nervous about the tasting but um it's something to note, you know, for, for sure. And keep in mind, because sometimes you go to the table and you pop something open and someone says, oh, no, this is no good. And you say, give it give it six minutes. And um, they, re they really did change. Thank you. I enjoy them. That's good. I wasn't sure. how we, we, I pulled these samples a week ago. Um, and so I wasn't, wasn't sure how they would handle. You know, the, these aren't finished wines. And so they kind of haven't been protected with, you know, the little bit of sulfur that we do add. And so... Um, so I was a little unsure how they were going to travel uh, and, and hang out for a week uh, in little bottles, but <laughs> but thanks for that. It's good to know. Yeah, and that the ones. So Michael actually, Michael's in Bar Harbor, so I sent him full bottles. So those were just like the full sample bottles, and then he opened okay. those and poured them for some other people in town. Um, so yeah, so that's I when I opened these the sample bottles here in Portland too, you know, like when I initially opened them, like I could, yeah, they smelled kind of vinegary, like it was it was it, they just they smelled like wine that was still fermenting, that was still like going through its process, um, you know. But like drinking them now, drinking them out of the glass, they're they're beautiful. Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah, so these are these. So this is very intriguing to me because I've never I don't know what these are from from <laughs> yeah. one and two. I, I don't know what wines. Is this this something new that you have not made before? Anything like this? Yeah, we've, we've never so we've never worked with Cab Franc before. Um, uh, we try to do something unique and different each year, um, kind of keep our creative. Uh, um, Keep our creative juices flowing and stuff. So, um, um, yeah. So uh, this year, um, I guess we had kind of decided on the Cab Franc a little earlier on, but um, but this year was very very hot and things were coming in really early. Um, and we tend to be we tend to um, want to pick some things on the earlier side. Like I said with the Chardonnay, we're, we're sort of we like the fresher flavors. Um, and so we tend to be kind of earlier pickers and in, and especially in Long Island, um, uh, the climate and the, and the growing season and the ripeness is, uh, is tough to get things really ripe there. And so I think for more consistency for house wines and stuff, it's a little bit, um, a little bit easier to rely on, on an earlier picking date. Um, so we can make that later style of wine. Um, but anyway, as, as the, as the, as the season was progressing, um, this was an early year and a pretty hot year. And we thought, okay, maybe this is our opportunity to, um, to make a bigger style red wine, um, uh, as just a, as a small lot, something, um, a one-off. And, um, so the, the, the hope, the goal here, uh, was, uh, to make a Cab Franc and it ripens very late on Long Island. Um, but the hope was to get it somewhere around 24 bricks or something It's about max for, for Long Island. Um, which would give us right around 14% alcohol. And that's about, that's about as ripe as we can get in Long Island um, for just about anything. Um, so that was kind of the goal. Um, seeing as it was hot and, and, and dry and things were ripening early, we thought this is, this is our chance. So, so that, was, that was kind of what we told the growers here. This is from a small, another small vineyard, um, again, nearby uh, that our friend Howard consults for. Um, 
but uh, but sort of similar type practices as, as, on our on our piece that we have the, the Chardonnay and the Merlot. Um, so anyway, as as the time went along, um, things things came things came off the vine early, really really well, and um, and then things kind of stalled, and um, and things weren't ripening as as much sugar as um, as we were sort of hoping or planning. And so we hung on to this Cab Franc, we hung on to the Cab Franc and said, oh, let it, let it hang a little bit longer. We'll see if we can get it to 23, 24. And, um, and it sort of just didn't want to go anywhere. Um, so for a few weeks, it just sort of sat there and didn't ripen any, um, at least in the, the sugar, that kind of thing. So anyway, um, we ended up picking it. Uh, let's see, this was picked on October 23rd and it was picked at 21 bricks. Wow. Um, so, uh, so it hit 21 and just kind of sat there <laughs> and didn't, it didn't go any further. Um, and uh, we may have even tried to push it a little bit, a little bit further because we were so hopeful. Um, uh, but Botrytis starts coming in a little bit um, late in the season there. Um, and uh, this stuff was starting to get, get a little bit of Botrytis on it. Um, and so we maybe even could have made the decision to pick five days earlier or something. Anyway, um, you can see the color, the, the botrytis kind of robs color um, is, is what one of, the, one of the big things it does. So it's a lighter, uh, lighter color, pretty color, but light. Um, and I think that's due to the botrytis, um, which I don't smell uh, overwhelmingly. I can get it, I, I get it a little bit in there, but, um, but anyway, the difference between wine number one and number two, or on this side, so it's so it's three and four. Uh, they're both Cab Franc, both picked same day, same vineyard. Um, the number one, the, or the number three, Frank Franc number one, is um, is destemmed and crushed into open top bins. Um, we use these plastic bins that are look, look like a big giant fish bait tub um, here in Maine, and um, and we do manual punch downs on it uh, three times a day, and um, and uh, I didn't put the time down, but I think it's about two weeks of manual punch downs, and then then scooped out and, and pressed and put into barrel. Um, and so plastic tub, um, and then picked and put into a barrel, then pressed and put into barrel. Uh, the second one. Um, was crushed and distemmed into a concrete, open concrete tank um, and fermented in there with manual punch downs for two weeks and then uh, scooped out and pressed and then put back into the concrete tank. Oh. Um, so um, yeah, so that's the difference here. Um, just to try to wind, wind to experiment with concrete and see what it does for us um, and um, and see if it makes any difference. You know, sometimes these, these choices that we make, um, sometimes they make a, um, sometimes they make a difference, sometimes they don't, or, or, or they make a, a subtle distance difference that, that doesn't, um, um, that's imperceptible. So that is that. Um, I'm just, I'm curious, is it the concrete, so it's an open concrete tank. Um, do you put like a, like a piece of cardboard or plastic or something like that over the top of it? Uh, or is it just like open with like the cap of skins, like sitting on top of the wine? Yeah. So, um, uh, there's, there's a couple of companies that make these really fancy concrete tanks that, um, that wineries buy. And, um, we, we weren't ready to go there quite yet and, and ship a concrete tank across the country or something. So, um, so we started looking into these um, concrete, the manufacturers of concrete vessels and things here in Maine. Um, and there's a, there's, a, there's a few of them, um, but we got what is called a pump tank um, from this place called Precast in Topsom. They make uh, uh, concrete culverts, uh, septic tanks, um, all sorts of like industrial concrete stuff. And um, we called them and asked what is exactly in this 
concrete, you know, what, what, what are the ingredients? And none of it offended us. And so we said, okay, let's give it a, let's give it a shot. Um, and so it's open topped and uh, it, ha it, it came with a lid, although we discovered that, um, that our floating, one of our floating lids for our uh, smaller stainless steel tanks fits right in it. Um, and so that's how, we, that's how we seal it up. Cool. Um, but during the fermentation, it's just open. We put a top on top just so a you know, cat doesn't fall in or something. Yep. Um, but, uh, but we take the top off and do the punch down, put the cap back on. Um, and then after we, after, we, um, after we press it then, um, then it goes right back in and we have the floating lid on the tank. Okay. So. All right, cool. Yeah. Um, would you say a little bit about, so you said that you left the Cabernet Franc on the vine, you let it sit and keep ripening to try and you know, get the sugar ripeness up and the sugar ripeness wasn't really going anywhere, but the grapes were obviously still ripening. Like what else was happening in the, the course of that, like a couple of weeks that they were still on the vine? Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the pH and the titratable acidity move around, move around a little bit. You know, as things ripen, the, the pH goes up and the titratable acidity goes down. We see some of that, um, but that stalls at some point kind of too. And certainly then there's that flavor development thing that is really too hard to put a measurement on. Um, you have to be out there tasting and um, whether you really trust your, trust your palate to taste the, the grapes here or there. But um, you know, we see more seed ripeness and stem ripeness and, and all that kind of things that, that are other indicators of, what, of, of uh, kind of how we determine ripeness as, as growers. Yeah. Um, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, but then just, you know, also being more prone to, uh, to the birds or fungal disease and that right. kind of thing. Right. So. That's right. It's everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, and one of my, one of my things with these Long Island reds is, um, um, like some other climates in the, in the world, um, one of the, one of the, one of the toughest things with red wines, um, is uh, is Britannomyces, um, and so Brit 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 Britannomyces uh, can only live in a wine in this in this kind of narrow um, spectrum of fruit chemistry or great or wine chemistry. So if you have a wine that's uh, over fourteen percent alcohol, uh, no no Britannomyces, and if you have a wine that's under uh, three point five pH, uh, pretty much no Britannomyces, and so. Uh, um, so for our sake, being natural winemakers who, who aren't going to manipulate the chemistry of fruit when it comes off the vine, we would like to do our best to pick either, um, either below 3.5 pH, um, so on, that's on the early side, or we want to get it up to, up to um, 24 bricks so that we can get 14% alcohol out of it, um, and then we have no Britannomyces. But, uh, but these, this Long Island fruit tends to play in that middle area a lot. Um, so, um, so our goal here was to get to the 14, which we, which, which we did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what do people think? Concrete, uh, uh, big difference, little difference, less, more subtle than you thought? Let me get a second glass. I think they are actually, to me, they, they seem pretty different. The color is different. The clarity is different. Yeah, to me, number one, has more sort of like aromatic, spicy, vegetal sort of qualities. Like it reminds me of um, like cooked rhubarb more. Yeah, heady, heady is a good way to put it, Jordan. And then number two,
feels darker and more savory and i feel like i like i perceive the tannins more on it too um and then there's also like there's a little bit of like a nutty meaty component in the very like back of the finish to it as well that that also like that that could just be where it is or that could be from like from i don't know from oxygen from the from from the bottle from you know like the sample getting here in the time that it's been like in yeah, exposed to air and stuff too um but they definitely the two of them seem pretty different do you have do you have ideas of what you're going to do with them um yeah well, I think aside, we're gonna... aside from put them in bottles and and i mean yeah. i like i enjoy them yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think we're, we're going to blend them together and it'll be yeah. um uh, last year we did this one we called uh, uh justice and we uh, did a donation to a charity uh, and it was kind of a wine club run and we did a, a skin contact um, Chardonnay pet nat was, was the thing. Um, and so I think this will go into that um, this year. So kind of a one-off, one-time thing. Mm -hmm. But excited to play with the, the, with the concrete again and we'll, and we'll try something different and unique in it maybe next year. Yep. And yeah. Um, cool. As far as vessel, as far as vessel goes, it was an inexpensive vessel too, um, which is interesting. Um, locally sourced and everything. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Cool. Okay. Um, so maybe we'll move on to the 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 third set, um, which is all Merlot. So wines five, six, and seven. Um, and so this is all Merlot, and this is from our vineyard Tucker's Lane. Um, a bulk of it we make the Morphos Rosé out of, and um, and then we try to save a little bit um, for just a little bit longer, ripen a little bit longer for this red. Um, and again, the Rosé sort of like the Chardonnay, we want to be the first ones on Long Island to pick rosé. We want it fresher and crisper and, and earlier. Um, and sort of the same with, with our red. Um, again, for, for consistency purposes in a, in, a, in a climate that's hard to ripen things to, to a big red, we'd, like, we'd prefer to consistently make a, a younger red, a fresher red. Um, and then kind of remembering what we talked to, what I talked about with the Britannomyces, we'd like to pick this below 3.5 pH. Um, and that'll protect us down the line from, from the Brett. And so this was picked, um, again, all, all three picked in the same, same day, September 25th, um, at about 20.5 bricks. And I think we were uh, kind of right in there at, uh, at the 3.5 pH range. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so the first one is what we would call maybe sort of pretty standard maceration. So this is us playing with skins again, um, sort of like the Chardonnay. So, so with the first one we call pretty much standard maceration. So crushed into stemmed into open top bins, um, manual punch downs for uh, 12 days and then pressed and uh, put into barrel. Uh, the second one um, is, ex is an extended maceration. So uh, crushed into stemmed, manual punch downs for 12 days, same as the first one. And then we put it up, and then we put it in a more sealed tank. Uh, so we have to scoop it out, put it in a, in a more sealed tank um, and seal it up for another 35 days with the skins. So it's uh, so wine number two is seeing 35 more days of skin contact, um, and stems stems are gone, but the seeds are there too. So so skins and seeds, and so that is that is wine two, and then wine three again all picked the same day. Um, number three is is a carbonic maceration of that same fruit. Um, so. 
picked and then immediately put into a tank that we can seal up completely. Um, whole whole clusters right in there, really layered in there really gently so nothing kind of crushes too, too quick or too early. Um, we seal the tank right up and uh, a fermentation, the, the grapes sort of slowly crush themselves a little bit, a little bit of juice starts fermenting at the bottom. Um, and then you get this kind of interberry fermentation. So all the all the all the berries are kind of fermenting with within the skin, um, completely. And there's and there's some crushing at the bottom. So you have wine at, at fermenting at the bottom of the tank as well. Um, but it's this sort of uh, under a saturation of carbon dioxide and fermenting in the berry that gives you these wild fruity characters. Um, and that was uh, 30, 33 days in that carbonic maceration tank. And then, uh, and then we pull it out and then crush it uh, and then, then keep on fermenting it and kind of till dryness in an open topped bin for like another, for I think it was another seven days. Um, and then finally pressed and put in, into barrel. Okay. So those are the, those are the three, three treatments here. Uh, at this point, so for, how, how long have they all been in barrel at this point? Um, so since um, kind of like the week before Christmas, we um, okay extended the extended macerations we we put into barrel. Okay, all right. So the so number number one has been in barrel for like approximately an extra month. That's right. Barrels? Okay. Yeah. But all pretty much neutral barrels. Um, we're not really looking for oak flavor. Mm -hmm. We're looking for the storage and. That sort of passive um, oxidation through this through the stave. So, and what is this going into the Oyster River Red? Is that what this will? will yes, this, this will turn into sort of our house, like our house red wine. Okay, have you have you done this in previous vintages? Have you blended like these three different uh, like like processes together? Or is this like, how, how is this different from previous vintages? Yeah, this is, um, uh, this is, uh, okay. So last year, I think we did a carbonic maceration of Merlot and a kind of a standard maceration of Merlot. Uh, we did, we have not done this extended maceration very okay. frequently. As okay. if you, yeah. Okay. Uh, what do you think of them so far? Um, this is my first time trying them in a little while, so <laughs> bear with me. But since they're like, like, cause the Cabernet Franc was an experiment, you know? So you are like, you were, or sort of an experiment or like something new, a one-off, but with these, with the Merlot, like this is going into the Oyster River Red. So it's like something that you've been making before so you, you kind of, you must already have an idea sort of in your head of like uh, something kind of sort of like where you're going with the red, like how do you see these three different wines sort of like coming together or fitting together to, to do that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, we, we, and we always experiment a little bit and every, every year things just turn out a little different depending on what the temperature is and how fast they ferment and all that kind of stuff. But my, but really my goal here with this Merlot and our house red wine is to have something, um, that I've really been enjoying drinking the last few years is a is a lighter style red, something that's got something that's got really nice big juicy fruit, but also but also I, I kind of want um, which I think we we can tend to do pretty well. Um, but sometimes we don't get as much as I as I want is a is a more kind of gritty rustic tannin that I that I really want a little bit more. Um, and so I was hoping to 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 extend that um, maceration and get more. Um, more tannin, kind of pull more tannin out, um, and that is the goal. Uh, so, uh, so tannin is really um, alcohol soluble. So tannin um, doesn't really come out until later on in the fermentation. So if a red, with a red, if you're only fermenting for five days and, and pressing, you may not get much tannin. But if the longer you ferment, the more tannin you you pull out because it's alcohol soluble. So it comes on, comes out more at the end of fermentation. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Which is which is different than color. Um, comes out early. Color is water soluble, so you tend to get your color early in the fermentation and the tannin late. Okay. Huh. 
cool. Yeah, and so so the the standard maceration was, was is is sort of like the um, you know we kind of we kind of lean on that as as the bulk of the body of of the wine. And we, we want the extended maceration to to bring that rustic tannin a little bit more, and then then we want the carbonic to bring that juicy um, front fruit is is the hope. Okay. So yeah, that's how we envision it. Okay. Um, do I... I don't know if it's still smelling, but when I pulled that, but when I pulled these samples, the carbonic was, I think, going through a little bit of a funny stage, like like crazy butter popcorn thing going on. So I don't know if it's still doing that or not in your samples, but. Not really. Um... It smell. It's very like fresh, crunchy, like fruit. Like really, I don't know. Like tart cherry. Like wild tart, wild cherry, and what is that? I can't. Like I can't quite put my finger on it. It's like a, it's a little bit like vegetal too. it is really cool to be able to taste all like these the three of them they're really drastically different from each other um i mean they have like they have some of the same fruit flavors and they I guess they have like comparable sort of acidity between the the three of them. So there's like, there's these similarities, but they do all really, you know, like you can really taste the effects of what you did, like with the fermentations and the skin contact in them. Yeah. That's right. So all of, are all of these three and a half percent Oh, camphor menthol. Yeah, that's a good call, Jenny. Yeah. Yeah, that like, like, cool, sort of spicy aromatic thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so all of these are like, below 3.5 pH. So you're, you're not worried about Brett in, in any of these. Yeah, and, I, and I'm not the best. I'm not uh, um, the most specific. Uh, I don't hang out. I don't hang out in the chem lab too often. So we don't we don't check too often. But but the hope is that we pick them kind of below 3.5 pH. Yep. Um, and pH does move around during fermentation. But yep. uh, the hope is that we kind of that we kind of can keep it keep it in that neighborhood. Um, yeah. And Brett, again, Brett is not like, you know, 3.49, you have nothing and, and 3.51, it's it's all over. Um, so there's a there's a there's a spectrum there. But um, but yeah, the hope is to is to naturally keep it down. Um, as opposed to uh, somebody who who didn't didn't mind adding things, um, and we're we're picking things in that in this ripeness category. So if it's going to be twelve percent alcohol or something, they might add tartaric acid right right early on to bring their pH down below three point five to stay safe. Okay. Yeah. Unless they knew they were going to be over fourteen percent alcohol, then they would then they wouldn't worry again. So, yeah. Do you, do you have an idea of how you are you going to just like blend all three of them together? And are, do you have? Did you split the amount of Merlot that you got? So is it like a third of it you did normal skin contact, a third of it you did extended maceration, and a third carbonic, or did you like do most of it one and then experiment a little bit with with other quantities? Yeah, I think we have, I think we have maybe uh, eight barrels of the standard uh, maceration. I think we have maybe five barrels of the extended maceration and two barrels of the carbonic maceration. Okay. All right. I'm going to try to pour them all together in my glass right now and <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> well, we may, we may, uh... I actually did and did that. It was pretty fun. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. 
So, um, so as we take these separately, we may choose to we may choose to up percentages of of one or the other um, next year as as we learn from as we learn from these experiments, and that's the whole. Um, but we'll but we'll smush them all together this year, and then we may might adjust next year based on this knowledge. That's the whole goal. Yeah, I like I like them all. I do really like the extended maceration one. Um, that that's cool. That worked out really well. Yeah, I, I, I really like what um, I really like what that's kind of giving giving us in that in that little bit more full body tannin character. Yeah. Um, and picking yeah. early, picking early gives us gives us a little more acidity and gives us the the, the fresh fruit. But but I kind of wanted to keep that. I, I wanted that tannin too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like it's a little darker. It has the gr like gritty gritty is a good way to call it. Like gritty, like slightly rustic yeah. tannin. Kind of yeah, um, yeah. And that's and that's pretty that's pretty easy for us to do. The only the only negative is that. Um, you know, all this stuff happens pretty late and Maine gets cold pretty quick and um and right. our your gets, barn your barn is is not very heated yeah our barn gets cold pretty quick and so um and so i think this extended maceration we dug out of the tank um you know right before christmas and dug, digging it out of the tank means that i have to get in the tank um and uh, and and shovel it out so uh okay. it's pretty cold yeah <laughs> cold yeah. and sticky <laughs> <laughs> yep <laughs> wow headroom 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 in the barn is, is not much we have to we have to kind of bring bring the tanks outside they're smaller tanks we have to bring the tanks outside and so we okay. hope that it's not you know yeah okay. 35 and raining or something that day and man yeah yeah <laughs> it requires wow. commitment that's for sure yep yep yeah one of the many, many reasons why there probably why there are not a lot of people making wine in Maine. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, Margot had a question earlier. She was asking, like, I I know you you know you've got Chardonnay and you've got Pinot Noir planted there now at the winery, and I you know I I'd, I'd love to know how they're doing. You know, I imagine like they're starting to produce fruit and stuff like that. Um, what does that mean as they start producing fruit and you start having Chardonnay and Pinot Noir from your own vines? Like, what does that mean for these wines and buying fruit from Long Island and stuff like that? Yeah, I think our, um, yes, we, we've, been, we've been experimenting the last couple of years with planting some, um, some vinifera on the farm, which is, which is not something that would be a recommended um, grape variety. To anybody by anybody for for Maine coast, um, but I've done it a little bit before and done some experiments uh, along 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 the line here in the last twenty years, and so um, and so we felt like we were ready to do to do a little bit of that. So we planted some Chardonnay and some Pinot Noir and a little bit of Pinot Blanc as well. Um, of any uh, so vinifera varieties, pretty much die right to the ground at like negative ten to negative fifteen degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere in that neighborhood, which um, which some years we don't see. This year we haven't seen it. We haven't we really come close. Um, but some years, you know, we could have a whole week that's that's, that's down there. And all it takes is one day, one night at uh, at negative ten, negative fifteen, and and they're dead to the ground pretty much. Um, but uh, but we're but we're protecting them in certain ways with the soil, um, hilling up and stuff, protecting them with the soil um, so that they'll survive at least at least on the at the bases um, and. Uh, yeah, we, we should we should get our first little bit of Chardonnay next year, um, and it, because it's such a drastically different climate though than, than Long Island, for example, it'll always be smaller lots, and um, we'll, I think the hope is to make a traditional method sparkling wine with um, with all that uh, vinifera fruit, sort of the the Chardonnay and the Pinot and the Pinot Blanc, but. Um, yeah, so far so good. Some some successes, some some failures. We see a lot of um, uh, something that we see in in not grapevines that aren't as hardy is crown gall, which is this bacterial disease that's in the soil um, that gets into the vine where there's injury. It could be a mechanical injury, like you whack it with a tractor, or or weather injury. It, the, the trunk cracks a little bit with cold, and it, and it'll get in there. Um, and it can kill a vine, and we and we're seeing that already a little bit more in the vinifera than we would in, in our hybrids that are more 
that are more hardy. Um, so that's disappointing, but, um, but we can sort of trim it out and, and prune it out where we see it and hopefully keep the vines going. So, um, but uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I guess if it's, if you, you know, you're not, you're not close to having the problem of having too much fruit and not knowing what to do with it. Like that's right. Right. years down the road if if you're ever going to get there so you've got yeah. plenty of time to like just keep experimenting and build build this other building there on the property and stuff like that and like you've yeah. got plenty of time to plan ahead and deal with it yeah and uh, you know the the long-term goal would, would maybe be we would love to be 100 percent growing all, all everything ourselves um but in reality, that's a little bit of heroic uh, yeah. for us right now. And that's probably like a 25 year down the line kind of. You've got to limit your heroics. You've got to, if you're already shoveling out tanks of like that's half right. frozen, you know, fermented grapes, like at the end of December and stuff. Yeah. There's only so yeah. much ho heroics you can, you can handle. Yeah. yeah and I think I, I think we've, we've, we've grown enough, uh, that uh, that we that we realize we don't have to be quite that heroic all the time right. um you know we were no longer plowing the vineyards with horses and stuff like that and so uh so yeah but in, in our at our level right now about four thousand cases I, we probably need about 30 acres of grapes to to produce all of that um and so that's that's a long ways down the line and here and then here we are with you know a couple of our most popular wines selling out too fast and we're thinking about growing growing them in addition so so hard to ignore those those wines that we do so well with from purchased fruit too um yeah yeah, yeah. Um, okay for that sorry i'm just going to follow up real quick um for that new acreage that you have going yeah do you think that's going to be mostly la crescent or do you think you're going to try for more vinifera Yes, we, we've planted about an acre of vinifera over the last couple of years. Um, and now, now I'm ready to plant some reds, um, some hybrid reds. I, uh, when we first moved here, I wasn't, I wasn't all that pumped about the hybrid reds that were available um, or the kind, of, the kind of wine that, that I saw produced from them. They sort of seemed like e easygoing, fruity, light style red wines. It was fine, but it didn't interest me that much. Um, but then, um, but then we got access to some a few years ago, starting a few years ago now, and we started doing carbonic maceration with these hybrid reds, um, Marquette and Sabrevois and Saint Croix, and I really like them. They're, um, uh, yeah, really fresh and and juicy and fruity, and um, and it's been a really fun wine. And um, we make this one called Carbonic Nation, and uh, and I really like it. And, um, and so now I'm excited to plant, plant some of our own. So, we, so we've got a couple acres of, of red grapes that come, that come to us from another couple growers here in Maine. Um, but, um, but we never know, know exactly year to year what's gonna happen to that, to that fruit, whether they're, um, how well they're gonna be managed or maybe they'll decide to sell them to somebody else or something like that. And so, so we feel like we really need to plant some more. So, so we're gonna plant two acres uh, of Marquette this um this coming spring okay yeah cool and then there's going to be more carbonic nation right and then there'll be more carbonic nation yeah great cool all right that's and a little bit more consistent you know some of these vineyards that we work with um they're lovely and we love to and we love to cultivate those relationships but some of them are really really small kind of like home homeowners with uh 100 vines who want to sell us their their fruit and then there's one of then there's a couple that are an acre or two um, and, uh, and we try to give them some guidance They're None of them are necessarily trained professionals, but we try to give them some guidance on how they could maybe increase their yields a little bit, or, uh, be a little bit better on their fungal, uh, you know, routine or whatever. Um, but, but, uh, but it doesn't always stick. And so we don't, we don't, it's a little bit inconsistent yields and, and quality. So, um, um, so we're hoping by planting, planting our own, we'll be a little bit more consistent with it. So. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, uh, Nancy was just asking 
like when that Chardonnay that you're the the first two, you know, that you're blending and stuff, like when is that when is that going to be available? When's that actually coming? Yeah, I think we we hope to bottle we hope to bottle sort of those fresher whites like in um uh end of March, April, that kind of neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Um and uh we add you know, so to these wines, basically our only add to these wines would be a little bit of sulfur before bottling. Um, and um, so we don't have a big problem with bottle shock really, or, or any of that kind of stuff, needing sulfur to, dissip the sulfur to dissipate or anything like that. We don't filter them. And so we release them pretty, pretty much right away. So somewhere in May, May 1st, June 1st, something like that. Okay. We'd be expect that. Okay. Yeah. Um, geez, I'm trying to think if I have any other, other particular questions about these. Um, any, do you have other plans for other fruit wines or like, like doing more with Ewing Fruit Project or are you more, more like tramp, getting more focused on on grape wines now. Yeah, I think we're getting more fo more focused on grape wines. Um, yeah, we were doing a, a wild blueberry um, fizzy wine that um, that was fun, um, but um, but we see it's one of our, it's for us it's one of our slower movers, and um, when everything else is moving really much faster and so we're uh yeah not not focusing on it too much right now but, um, but yeah the, the grape stuff is is going well so okay that's really the focus okay yeah and i guess that's i mean that's sort of that's like what you originally got into wine for right that was sort of the initial vision and and then trying and certainly trying to use some of these um you know the local stuff that which makes us happy apples and the, and the blueberries a little bit um but uh, but as our vineyards produce a little bit more, and then we and then we're also forging uh, really good relationships with the other growers that we work with and buy the fruit from, um, uh, that makes us more you know proud and stuff too. So uh, yeah, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, does anybody else have any any questions for Brian right now about these or about? winemaking philosophy. Cool. Wow. Well, thanks, Brian. Thanks for thanks for sending thanks for letting us take taste tank samples. Yeah, because that's pretty, pretty awesome that to be able to get to taste through these things like while I'm sitting here in my warehouse in Portland or where we are all in our in our homes right now and be able to like taste, you know, like the background of how how you actually put wines together and like the like your your approach to doing this and and why is pretty awesome. Yeah, thanks for yeah, I totally uh, agree, Ned. Ned, this was this was really awesome to experience uh, the pieces of wine and and hearing you discuss the way they might come together is just fascinating. Uh, this was awesome. Thank you so much for your time. This actually, now that I've mixed all of the Merlot together, you know, one, two, and three. Now that I've mixed them together, like on sort of the the same uh, like like proportions that that you said you were using them or or we're gonna that, that you had them um it actually does taste a lot like oyster river like it tastes like identifiably sort of like oyster river red to me like it, it does taste like like last year's vintage so so that's um so that's cool like it seems like it's going in the like the direction that you wanted um right yeah yeah the like the the aromatics using like one as a base and then the aromatics from the carbonic and the sort of like the tannin and the structure and stuff of, of number two, they work really well together. Yeah. 
Mm. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Thanks for doing this. Um, thanks everybody for, uh, for, for watching and taking part and paying attention. Um, like, uh, like I've said before, if you have leftover empty little sample bottles, if you're coming by the warehouse or you can swing by and drop them off, like on the shelf by the door, that's awesome. I'm always happy to take them back, wash them and reuse them. Um, next week I was planning on doing, uh, Portugal, but I still haven't gotten these Portuguese wines that I tried to direct import from Portugal. Um, they're probably going to arrive tomorrow or like Monday or something like that, but it's been like months and months and months. I'm still waiting for these Portuguese wines. So I think I'm just going to fall back on uh, what I just know really well, which is Sicily. And so I'll do next week, I'll do Sicily. Um, I'll probably do, I, I at some point I want to do Mount Etna as an individual seminar but next week I don't because I've I've done Mount Etna like two years ago and like I've taught I talk about Mount Etna all the damn time. Um, so next week I'm not just going to do Mount Etna. I'm going to do Sicily and I'm going to sort of like intentionally I'll include like one thing from Mount Etna, but I'll try to just do a lot of other stuff, things from like the rest of Sicily, um, and try to make try to make it a little bit like broader than that. So. That's my plan for next week. And then, and then the week after that, Portugal, for real. Definitely, I will do Portugal. I'll have all of my new like direct imported Portuguese wines and stuff. And so I'll do Portugal. And then I'll probably do Beaujolais out the week after that. So anyway, and next week, I'm going to move the time. Instead of doing it at 2 o'clock, I'm going to start it an hour later at 3 so that I am not competing with the state CDC uh, briefing on Thursday afternoon because, you know, that makes sense. So anyway, I'll send emails out. Uh, if you want to do Sicily next week, uh, just, you know, email me, text me RSVP, but, um, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Brian. Thanks for going through and doing all of this. It's really exciting. I'll see you all later. Bye.